Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Doxy Church for this communion service. I've actually mentioned to the people who we have here, we've got Jenny Mash and we've got Reverend Bill, who's going to preach and preside for us. And also we've got Jeff Moore on the controls. And I've actually mentioned it's almost warm enough to turn the heating off. Jenny disagrees. So she's happy that heating's on, but uh, I'm feeling quite warm, but it might be the layers that I'm wearing. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a definite spring morning and my daffodils at home are just on the verge of spring, you know, coming out. I did see some beautiful ones at St. Paul's yesterday morning. So I think the sign of daffodils is uh, a sign of hope. We come now to our order of service and we listen to our first hymn which is, there is a Redeemer. Turning to our order of service, we say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I pray the collect for this, the first Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Give us grace to discipline ourselves in obedience to your spirit. And as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Peter. Chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which is which this pre-configured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with the angels, authorities and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you, O Christ. Lord, grant that we may always hear your word with understanding, receive it with faith, and obey it with courage. Amen. Well, here we are, first Sunday in Lent again. 
Now, unless you're uh, taking on a particularly strict Lenten discipline, you're not going to notice much difference this year. For nearly a year, our lives have been one long Lent. With restrictions and denials of so many things that we normally enjoy. But Christmas is behind us. And Lent prepares us for Easter, when we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus once again. For many of us, life has lost so much of its variety in recent months, that it's helpful to have the seasons of the church year to help us notice and mark the passing of time. I mean, it comes to something when you notice day by day your toothpaste tube getting slimmer in the morning. Christmas is behind us, Easter is ahead of us. The birth of Jesus gives way to his death and resurrection. As Peter says, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. But what about everything that comes between those two great festivals of the Christian year? The events marked by Christmas and Easter. Why did Jesus live? Why did he spend those three intense years of activity in his ministry, traveling the length and breadth of his country? Now you may think that's an odd question. After all, we've got his teaching, including the parables and the incomparable wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount. We've got his miracles, his prayers, and his preparation of those disciples to go and take his message to the ends of the earth. But just look for a moment at the creeds of the church, those great statements of belief that were hammered out in the early centuries. In a few moments, we'll say the Apostles' Creed. We affirm, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Or the longer Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. Now, in the Apostles' Creed, all that comes between Mary, who brought Jesus to birth, and his suffering and death is a comma. In the other, at least, we get a full stop before for our sake, he was crucified. Obviously, the learned and eminent folk who hammered out those creeds in the early days of the church didn't think it was worth including anything about Jesus' life. Perhaps we only need to believe in his birth, death, resurrection, and return. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John that needn't have wasted all their parchment Let's have a look at this morning's gospel reading. Mark tells us how Jesus' ministry began. He doesn't give us any detail of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. No, in characteristic Mark fashion, Jesus is straight out of the starting gates. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near, repent, and believe the good news. Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially focus on this idea of the kingdom of God. It was at the very center of Jesus' message. Think how many of his parables describe what the kingdom is like. So Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is about God's rule as he draws the whole of creation back to himself, restoring it to what he had always intended it should be, 
from the beginning. We might, from time to time, catch a little glimpse of it now. We won't see it fully until God winds up history. We take our place within the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth. No, I haven't got the keyboard. The keyboard is, you know, the thing that you type into. Oh, yes. Right. Just to remind us that you are out there, I hope. But Jesus did far more than just teach. He actually embodied the new creation in the midst of the old creation. For the first time since the Garden of Eden, there was a human being on earth in whose life God was perfectly present. That's why Jesus lived. The image of God in Jesus had not been spoiled. That's the whole purpose of those temptations in the wilderness. Jesus was not going to go the way that everybody else went. The image of God remained intact and whole in him. He enjoyed perfect fellowship with his God, with God the Father, his Father. That had always been God's intention for humanity, for you and me. That's why Jesus could announce at the very beginning of his ministry, the kingdom of God has come near. When I am with you, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is coming near to you. The Old Testament prophets, of course, they'd, for hundreds of years, they'd looked forward to the coming of God's kingdom. They began to see what that would mean, what it would look like. Luke tells us that Jesus began his ministry by reading from the prophet Isaiah, preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And Jesus said to his listeners there in Nazareth, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. His being there with them was the fulfillment of so much of Old Testament prophecy. As Jesus walked and talked, the kingdom of God came near to the people he met. As the disciples watched what he did and listened to what he said, they were immersed in the new life of the kingdom of God. They would be sent out by themselves to embody the life of the kingdom in the midst of the old creation. And so it's gone on down the centuries. Followers of Christ, people who have been baptized into him, you and me today are to embody the life of the kingdom of God, wherever we are, in our families and in our communities, in our work and our other activities. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, writes St. Paul. The old has gone, behold, the new has come. We are to be people who live that new creation right now in the midst of the old creation. What does that look like? Asking the question, why did Jesus live, leads us to the question, why do we live? Well, Jesus' ministry began after his temptation in the wilderness. Mark doesn't give us any detail. But if you look in Matthew and Luke, you'll see how important, how important it was for Jesus to show that he was going to live in an entirely new way, different from the way everybody had lived before. The man who embodied the kingdom of God would make a radical break from everything that had gone before. The new creation, 
beginning in him, needed a fresh start. Remember those temptations? Well, firstly, Jesus rejected the opportunity to satisfy his own needs by turning stones to bread. Now, you and I, we can't do that. But we are always tempted to put ourselves first. As people of the new creation, in the midst of the old, we will be known as those who put others' needs before our own. We'll be looking out to put our best efforts into serving others. Parents will know that that's a natural part of bringing up children, of course. But it should be part of our working lives, looking out for the people around us, when we can go to work, that is. Looking out for the people around us in particular need. It should inspire people to political involvement or community action. Our practical acts of caring and kindness, especially when they put us out, are just small signs of the new creation in the midst of the old. So in the week that's ahead of you, locked down though you may be, wait to see what the Prime Minister has to say to us, but we're still going to be confined, aren't we? In the week ahead, think of those little things, the phone call, the letter, to show that you care about someone. Jesus then rejected the temptation to test God by throwing himself from the temple. That's not a temptation that comes to us, is it? I doubt we have that kind of vision of ourselves throwing ourselves off a high building. No, but there is always the temptation that creeps into religion. That if we do something, God is bound to do something. That if we do something good, God's going to reward us. That if we get into a scrape, he's going to help us out. So many religions, including the Jewish faith of Jesus' day, have this transactional view of God. Do a particular thing and God's going to help you out. It's a bit like putting the right coin in a slot machine to get the goodies out. Lenten disciplines that we might take on are not about impressing God so he'll be good to us. In our consumer-driven society, our disciplines can show that there is a different way of living, a different set of priorities. That's what it means to be somebody of the new creation in the midst of the old. God works in a different way from the way the world works. People may sometimes feel that he's let them down. And we'll meet, we'll talk to, we'll draw alongside when we can, people who feel that God has let them down. They'd expected more from him, they'd been good. He'd never done anybody any harm, as people always said to me when we were preparing for a funeral. They'd expected more from God, transactional, if I'm good, God will do something for me. This pandemic has shattered so many people's hopes. It has made so many people feel vulnerable. They wonder why God didn't intervene to help them or their loved ones. We can gently introduce them to the God who lived a human life with all its hardship and eventually suffered and died. God did not intervene to stop Jesus dying upon the cross. This is the God of grace, the God who loved them, the God whose undeserved favour and help come to us at times of need and get us through. We mustn't have a transactional view of God. Finally, Jesus refused to bow down and worship the tempter. He knew which direction his life was going to take. Ever since Adam and Eve in the garden, in eating that apple, people have compromised with the devil in one way or another. 
However noble our aims and ambitions are, they are almost certainly tinged with that idea of getting on ourselves, of doing okay for ourselves. If our aims and ambitions are not directed to God, then they are misplaced. Worshipping God alone means giving him the first place in our plans, our families, our careers, and in every aspect of our lives. Of course, as I said, at the moment, life is on hold. <clears throat> if you want a good Lenten discipline these days, this year, give up socialising and going out for meals and things like that. It's so easy. We can't travel. We can't meet people. And many people are unable to get to work. At times like this, well, we might just have a little more time to pray. Not a bad idea, anyway. As Christians, we've got some idea of what God wants for his world. As Christians, we believe that God wants justice, peace, hope, opportunity for all. Think of situations and people in the world as it is. And compare them with the world we long for. We're well placed to do this as people who've got a glimpse of what the kingdom of God means, as people who are a new creation living in the midst of the old. And as you compare the world as it is with the world that God wants, bring that to him in prayer. Pray that those situations, that pain, that suffering, that injustice, that unfairness, the things which are rife in our world today will be transformed into what God wants his world to be. That the values of the kingdom of God will be seen in the affairs of our human life, our government, governments around the world. We're people of the new creation in the middle of the old. And that's what intercession means it means standing between those two things we're well placed to do that and of course we don't do it on our own even though we're scattered around the town watching on ipads and screens and listening on the phone and whatever else we are never forget that we are the church as bishop tom wright often says christianity isn't an individual race, it's a team sport. We're in this together. The church is a beacon of the new creation in the middle of the old. One day, we'll be back together. But for now, we're members of Christ's body, individuals and part of it, embodying what God wants for his world. Jesus blazed a trail for us. He lived to blaze that trail. Any Lenten discipline that we might take on is showing that we are ready to follow him, to be people of the new creation in the midst of the old, people who embody his kingdom, his rule, and its life. Here and now. Amen. Oh Lord my God, when I ain't awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the
We affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I invite Jenny forward to lead us in our intercessions. First of all, a prayer of praise and thanksgiving. Lord, we praise you for bringing light into our darkness and joy into our sorrow, for filling our lives when we feel empty and for guiding us when we are lost, for restoring us when we are broken and for holding us when we are hurting. Lord, we praise you for the utter assurance of your love and care, that we can turn to you in times of struggle. We praise you for your goodness and the fact that you are faithful and never change. Amen. 
in our prayers of intercession this morning to the words, Lord, in your mercy, please respond. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for countries in our world who have less resources and infrastructure to respond to COVID-19. Lord, in your might and power, limit the impact of the virus in some of the most vulnerable countries. Give governments great wisdom as they put in preventative measures. We pray too for Christians in persecuted parts of the world where they are being denied health treatment and are struggling for their basic needs. Thank you, Lord, for the work of agencies that bring help and relief. May they know your help and protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the vaccination rollout programs happening across our world. May you multiply their effectiveness in protecting and saving lives. We pray that countries would collaborate and serve each other, working together to fight the virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for great wisdom for our government and health advisors. Please guide their decisions and help them to communicate plans clearly. We pray particularly for our Prime Minister and his government as they outline the roadmap for the future. May people's safety and your kingdom values be paramount. Sustain our leaders and grant them energy during a time when they will be working long hours under great stress and strain. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for health workers around the world. We give thanks to the incredible NHS staff and care workers here in the UK. Lord, sustain and keep them during these times. Grant nurses, doctors and other health professionals great wisdom as they make medical decisions and give them energy and resilience as they continue to work long hours under great pressure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we entrust to your tender care those who are ill or in pain, knowing that whenever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. We pray for those people who are waiting for treatment or surgery and those recovering from surgery. Comfort and heal them and restore them to health and strength. Lord, we thank you that your perfect love casts out all fear. We pray for those in our communities and further afield who are feeling gripped by fear during these times. We pray that where there is fear, your peace would reign. And in a few moments of silence now, we bring to God those we know who are in need of his love, healing and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, as we remember before you the thousands who have died, surround us and all who mourn with your strong compassion. 
be gentle with us in our grief. Protect us from despair and give us grace to persevere and face the future with hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our two churches to be a light and hope to our communities during this pandemic. May we be people of the new creation, people who embody God's kingdom and its life here and now. Loving God, help us to point others towards your love with our practical acts of love and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you know how hard it is at the moment. We cannot travel, we cannot meet our family and friends, and we have to keep everyone at a distance. And sometimes we feel so isolated. Help us to keep you at the center of every aspect of our lives, whether at home, at work, or out and about in the community. Help us to pray and to look for opportunities this week to show that as your people, we care passionately about others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We come now to share the peace. It's in our church services where we gather together. It is an opportunity to shake hands or whatever else is appropriate. Somehow now we need to be sharing the peace of Christ across and around our community. So as we do so, think of your brothers and sisters in Christ in the churches. Imagine that you're actually with them. Christ's peace is reaching over this community because we, his people, are present here. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Four of us here in church have shared peace at about 20 feet between each of us. The next hymn we're going to have now is As the Deer Pants for the Water. Thank you. 
The Lord is here. The Spirit, the Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these forty days you lead us into the desert of repentance, for a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer, and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendor of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, the broken bread and wine outpoured, may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised him, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is alive. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes, and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with St. Thomas and Andrew, St. Paul and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us
come to uh, conclude in prayer after communion. I would like to thank Ian for leading the service, Jeff for the technical stuff, Jenny for uh, prayers. Thank you all for joining us in this act of worship. In a moment we're going to pray that God will send us out in the power of the Spirit and we will come along for the day that we can indeed go out. Even now we are Christ's people here in this community in different ways through modern technical media and such like we can be people of the new creation in the midst of the old. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. <coughs> the hymn, O oh, praise the name, I cast my mind to Calvary. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound. Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah's dead, and all alone. Oh, praise the
give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.